if it's distracting, don't go on Facebook while the preacher's preaching. Welcome to our moms in the moms area and then moms and dads in the T zone. It's great to have you. Well done for bringing your toddler to church. Turn with me in your Bible to Genesis chapter 14. All right, so we'll be reading from verse 14, so Genesis chapter 14, verse 14. Are you guys ready? Okay. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken prisoner, that is Lot, he assembled his 318 trained men born in his household, and they went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he and his servants deployed against them... um, speaking of the kings that had taken his nephew Lot prisoner, deployed against them by night, defeated them, and pursued them as far as Hobah to the north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods and also his relative Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Kedaloma, for some reason Cheddar, I just like see a cheese block when I see this guy's name, Chedaloma. And the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, went out to meet him in the Shaveh Valley, that is the king's valley. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out wine, uh, bread and wine. He was a priest to God Most High. He blessed him and said, Abram is blessed by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has handed over your enemies to you. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people, but take the possessions for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand in an oath to the Lord God Most High, creator of heaven and earth that I will not take a thread or sandal strap or anything that belongs to you, so that you can never say I made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the servants have eaten. But as for the share of the men who came with me, Ana, Eshkol, and Mamre, they can take their share. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless your word this morning to our hearts. Press it deep down. I pray, Heavenly Father, that our hearts would be ready and open to receive your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. The context of Genesis 14, Abraham did his little um, lack of faith sideshow to Egypt, and uh, he gets back on track by going back to Canaan, and then Lot gets disgruntled because there's not enough space for them, and Lot separates from Abraham. God speaks directly after Lot has left Abraham. And he says, I'm giving you the land of Canaan. That's Genesis 13, verses 14 to 18. God says to Abraham, I want you to walk the full length and breadth of the land. This is really significant if you understand uh, ancient custom. A king would walk around uh, the full breadth and length uh, of his land to demarcate the territory that he owns. This is a symbolic act of legal legal acquisition. So Canaan has been delivered into Abraham's hand. Then a powerful alliance of kings, led by a king called Chedaloma, cheese man, has surrounded the land and defeats an alliance of kings living in the land. And at the same time, they take Lot, Abram's nephew. So Abram gets drawn into this um, conflict and he defeats the alliance of kings who have made war with the kings living in the land and he rescues his nephew. So at the end of this scene, where we come to in Genesis 14, Abraham holds in his hand the plundered wealth of all the kings surrounding and inside of Canaan. Although the king of Sodom tries to negotiate a deal with Abraham, Abraham's like, I need nothing from you. God will make me wealthy. God has essentially given all the strongholds of Canaan into his hand. And all of a sudden, Melchizedek someone of whom we know no background, 
A strange figure described as a king and a priest comes out to meet Abraham to bless him. And Abraham gives God a tenth of the plunder he had accumulated. And so what do you think I'm going to talk about this morning? We're going to do a deep dive into tithing. And uh, in a time of financial stress, I could think of no more fitting message that's going to bring us freedom. It's going to be two sermons into one. It was like too long, uh, yeah, too short to make two, into two weekends and too long for a 30-minute sermon. So we're just going to be in church for a while this morning. But we won't go over 10.30. Is that fine? When we talk about tithing in the Bible, what am I talking about? Um, I believe the biblical definition of tithing is bringing the first slash best, tenth, ten percent, on all your increase to the Lord. That's what I believe is the biblical definition of tithing. The first ten percent of all your increase. In the Bible, there are free will offerings. There are, in our day, building fund offerings, giving to the poor, But this is not what we're talking about this morning. We are talking about the tithe. Whose is it? What do we do with it? What is it for? And what does it release over our lives? Because this topic can get many in the church's heart racing a little. I've had a letter about tithing delivered in the offering basket, anonymous, with a uh, 10-point... argument why tithing is not biblical um, before. So I understand that this can be contentious for some people. Um, So let's settle things down a bit. And let me tell you this, that this is actually the first time in six years that I have preached on tithing in leading this church. I don't think an accusation can be brought against this church that we speak about money all the time. Um, Secondly, we keep no record of who is tithing, and uh, no one will ever know. And we encourage anonymity, is that a right, is that a word? Being anonymous when giving, because this is primarily an issue between you and God. And thirdly, you may hear that we're talking about finances, but I believe this is more a message about faith and financial freedom than it is about trying to get more money into the church bank account. So I want to start off with some humor. Uh, The staff team have described this as very edgy humor, but I thought we should just laugh this morning. Karen, the sermon was a little weak. Sorry, where's it? Pastor, so is your tithing. Maybe I can get a little bit more edgy this morning. There was a man who asked a pastor, why should God get 10% of my money? To which the pastor replied, why should God allow you to keep 90% of his money? You feel the burn? (laughs) Okay, this is just for fun. Solid Ground has got a history of generosity. And uh, we want to celebrate that this morning. And uh, for those that maybe have struggled with this concept of tithing and have not experienced the joy and the freedom that it brings, this is an invitation to come taste and see that the Lord is good. Um, My parents taught me to tithe from a young age, back in the day when there was still a five rand note, the purple one with Jan van Riebeck on, is that right? Was it Jan van Riebeck on a five rand note? He had funny, like, wavy hair. I think it was fake. But... um, um, five rand note, and it was my responsibility to get a 50 cent coin change somehow and get that ready for Sunday. And so tithing has been ingrained in me. And um, let me tell you this, you don't have to understand the full kind of biblical teaching of tithing to tithe and to experience its blessing. In fact, uh, you don't have to be um, 
an academic biblical expert to enjoy the blessings of God given in his word. The gospel is actually simple because all of us are foolish, no matter how clever we are. You can be so clever that you're actually dumb. And um, so thank the Lord that uh, this teaching um, will only serve to, I believe, give us a, a wonderful foundation to affirm what we can experience, um, whether we get all the links of the scriptures that uh, give us a theological foundation for tithing or not. In other words, let me put it to you like this. What if someone at the end of your life, on your deathbed, had to say to you, you know what, man, <laughs> you tithed your whole life, but I'm here to tell you that tithing was actually never biblical and you, you never had to tithe. To which I don't think you'd reply, oh, I wish I hadn't given all that money to God. I think you'd be like, who cares? So what? No one is going to be on their deathbed thinking, I wish I gave less away. Especially into the hands of the living God. Abraham is a picture of every believer's journey of faith. That's why he's described as the father of our faith. You can look at Abraham and you can say, God, this is a picture of the pilgrim's journey. Called from nothing, not serving God, not looking for him. There was my dad backpacking Europe, didn't know God, came from a broken family, alcoholic father. All of a sudden, God meets him declares the name of Jesus. Why? God's grace. And even if you grew up in a Christian home, at one point God had to become real to you and you could actually, if you think about it hard enough, you'll realize, sure, why me? So you can divide Abraham's life into three components that are universal or comparable to our faith journey. Firstly, Abraham is saved by grace. Genesis 15 verse 6 says he believed God and he was uh, it was credited to him as righteousness. This is true for everyone who comes to faith in Jesus. We are justified by faith in Christ alone. That is, we don't add our works or bring our works. We don't work up to salvation. Every other religion is do, do, do. The gospel is, it has been done. And we come merely as, as poor people with nothing to bring. And we receive. So Abraham was declared righteous. The second component of Abraham's life is that he, pers he persevered in faith. What does this mean? Well, Abraham was called by God, responded to God in faith, declared righteous, and then he suffered trials, experienced the relief that, uh, you know, of God's kindness at key moments. He received promises. He waited for the fulfillment. Although imperfect, he kept believing that God would do what he said he would do. In other words, he learned obedience. This has not got to do with his redemption. This is flows out of redemption. Now that you're saved, I want to teach you how to walk like a son who trusts me. And this is true for all of us. And the third component of Abraham's journey we can read about in Genesis 22 and onwards, it's where he receives his reward or inheritance. This is not a matter of justification, this is a matter of God has something for Abraham over and above saving him, a promise for him. And Abraham is an example to us of someone who got what God promised because he persevered in faith. He made many mistakes. He went to Egypt when he shouldn't have. He repented. He went back to the land. He doubted whether his body and Sarah's body could produce a child but he just kept believing and kept going along with God. He never went back to his father's house. He never, he never called it quits. How will you and I inherit the more that God has for us? Just keep believing and trusting and learning obedience. Keep getting up in faith. Keep standing up when you fail. Keep relying on the grace of God when you sin because where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. But if you push pause on your spirituality when you sin, you say, well, you know what, I'm just going to dive even deeper into sin, then, you, then, then you're doing the opposite of what Abraham exampled for us. 
repent at every occasion of sin. Rely on the grace of God and keep going. So in talking about tithing today, I am talking about something that falls into component two and three. Sorry, can you just put those points up again for me, please? I'm talking about the persevering in faith that flows out of our redemption. I'm talking about living in the blessing of the reward of God's promises out of an act of obedience. And tithing is not the only act of obedience, but it is a significant act of obedience that brings great blessing to us. In other words, tithing is something that we have a reason to do because we are saved. And I'm going to repeat that many times during the sermon so that you don't walk away thinking, I live under a law and if I don't give money to the church, God is very upset with me and I may or may not be saved. Because that's not what I'm saying. Wonderful. Let's look at what Jesus says about tithing. Firstly, Jesus says that ministers will be funded by the beneficiaries of the ministry. Matthew 10 verses 9 to 10, speaking to his 12 disciples who he sends out, he says, don't acquire gold, silver, or copper for your money belts. In other words, before you head out into ministry, don't make sure you've got a million bucks in the bank account so that you can provide for yourself during the ministry. Then he says, don't take a traveling bag for the road or an extra shirt, sandals, or a staff. In other words, don't try to look for your whole ministry journey and say, do I have everything I need before I enter into this ministry journey? He says to him, a worker is worthy of his food. You will be supplied by the recipients of your ministry. In Matthew 23, Jesus teaches us that tithing is not to be neglected. In pronouncing his woes upon the scribes and Pharisees for totally missing the point of the law and the heart of God, he says to them, you guys are really good at tithing. You tithe on everything, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law like mercy, justice, and faithfulness. And then if there was ever a time where Jesus would have said, you know what, scrap tithing because of the new covenant and, it's, and don't worry about it, he doesn't say that. He says you should pay attention to mercy, justice, and faithfulness without neglecting the tithing. He speaks to his disciples and his followers in Matthew 6, Sermon on the Mount, and he says, where your money goes, there your heart follows. Don't store up for yourselves, this is Matthew 6, 19, verses 20 to 21. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Will be also. Um, I, um, I don't really like, know much about investing. Sometimes people think because I've studied accounting that I know stuff like that, but but I really don't. But what I do pick up when talking um, with people about investing and stuff is everyone, the whole world wants to know what's a good investment, right? What's going to beat the market? You know? I don't know how many traders or investors are on here, but I think everyone kind of cares. And we hear of people investing in this and that. And, you know, is investment A going to be better than investment B? And you've got a little bit of extra money. And should I do this or that? Bitcoin? Link it to the S&P 500. Let me throw some terminology at you this morning. Okay. Jesus knows the future. He knows how this all plays out. And he says there's two shares, share A and share B. This is a loving warning of a friend. Don't invest... In the treasures of the earth, where moth and rust destroy, but invest in treasures in heaven, because that is the greatest investment. And I know the end at the beginning. And then he says, finances and the heart are connected. I ask you, why is there some, such a strong connection between finances and the heart? Maybe you have to think this morning about what money represents. Your time 
your talents, your sacrifice, your hard work, and your opportunities. If I have this money, I can do X, Y, and Z. I can buy, buy this toy for myself. I can buy this or that or the next thing. And so where your money goes, there a large part of your life goes because you've invested a lot of your life to get that money. If I had to ask in this building who has a heart for the church, you'd find that people who tithe would, on a truthful level, say, I have a heart for the church. Jesus says you can serve God or you can serve money, but you can't serve both. Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. That word money is mammon, um, and um, there is a teaching um, where mammon is described as a spirit um, behind greed for excessive wealth. A spirit that enslaves. So Jesus describes money as something that actually can be enslaved to. You can actually, you can, there can be a servant-master relationship to money. And Jesus says, you want to be serving God. But God will not divide his glory. And both for you as well. You can't play games where... A little bit of serving money and a little bit of serving God. It's not the nature of how we walk with God. You're either all in or you're not in at all. And so I say to you this morning, how do I make sure I'm not serving money? We serve God with our money. Which sounds like wisdom, right? True? which is fortunately not from me, it's from Proverbs 3 verse 9, it says, honor or serve the Lord with your possessions, with the first produce of your entire harvest, then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. This sounds like a good investment, right? This sounds like financial freedom, right? Jesus never directly says this, but I think it's obvious that Tithing doesn't bring you to salvation. Tithing is a response that flows out of salvation. John 3.16, For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only son, so that everyone who gives money to the church will not perish but have eternal life. Thank the Lord that that is not what is said. But everyone who believes, free, come and drink freely, without payment. Then Jesus says in John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So let me tell you this, all Christian obedience comes from a secure relationship of love. God loved us first and we respond to his love and faith. Those who trust in Jesus love him and want to obey him. Justification or being made righteous comes by faith in Christ alone. Faith in Christ is granted by grace Unmerited favor, the fact that you see the Son of God and see your need for Him is an act of grace. The Holy Spirit did that work in your life. Works flow from faith. The works of faith amount to reward and blessing, not to salvation, because that was for free. Let's look at Malachi 3 verses 6 to 12. Very famous passage that um, talks about tithing. This was about 500 years before the birth of Jesus. Um, Israeli exiles had returned from Babylon after 70 years. And um, they rebuilt the temple and the city walls under Ezra and Nehemiah. And the people had high hopes for prosperity and peace. But Malachi comes in a time where the prosperity and peace, although the temple was rebuilt and it was sort of half of the glory of what it used to be, this prosperity and peace had not been realized and the people were disillusioned. 
They felt like God had not uh, been faithful to them. They felt like God didn't love them anymore. They were in the middle of a severe drought. The economy was on shaky ground. Ungodly people who were disobedient were enjoying prosperity. And the people were asking themselves, is it worth doing any good? And God sends Malachi. And he says this. This is verse 6 of chapter 3. Because I, the Lord, have not changed, you descendants of Jacob have not been destroyed. Since the days of your ancestors, you have turned from my statutes. You have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of armies. Yet you ask, how can we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. How do we rob you, you ask? By not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions. You are suffering under a curse. Yet you, the whole nation, are, ro are still robbing me. Bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord of armies. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not ruin the produce of your land and your vine in your field will not fail to produce fruit, says the Lord of armies. Then all the nations will consider you fortunate for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of armies. A couple of thoughts on Malachi chapter 6, I mean 3 verse 6 to 12. God begins with saying, I the Lord have not changed. Thank God that he doesn't change. If God goes back on his word and his promises, we are all in trouble. But he doesn't. You see, the people were accusing God of unfaithfulness. Yet God says, it's not me that's the problem here, it's you. My promises for blessing and my conditions for blessing remain the same, yet you have moved away. I have not changed. This is not unfaithfulness on God's part, but unfaithfulness on the people's part. In Malachi's day, there was corruption in worship. The priests were not bringing the best for the offerings unto God. They were not honoring God in the way they worshipped as a people. The priests were bored. They just went through the motions. Oh, got to just get my job done today and do some sacrifices for the people. Men were divorcing their wives to marry, marry younger, sexier women. Unfaithfulness in the people. They were consulting sorcerers. There was adultery, swearing falsely, cheating, cheating workers of just wages, ignoring and oppressing orphans, widows, and not caring for the needs of the foreigner in their midst. In other words, the people were up and down. The economy was up and down. But God doesn't change. And so he says in verse 7, return to me and I will return to you. From the days of your ancestors, you have moved away from me. But I have not unredeemed you. I am still your God. But you are acting as if you are unredeemed. Return to me. Because I am here waiting. I am still here. Let me remind you this morning that what Malachi, as spokesman for God, is he's saying, I'm speaking to a redeemed people. I'm speaking to my people. And I want my people to enjoy my covenant prosperity and peace. The people then ask, how can we return to you? Remembering all their unfaithfulness, should we stop this? Should we fix up that? How should we turn around, Lord? How should we show you that we are serious about you? And God answers with a question, and then he lays a charge against them. He says, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. And then verse 8, he says, By not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions, you are suffering under a curse. Yet you, the whole nation, are still robbing me. In other words, God narrows the root cause of their unfaithfulness and the resultant misery down to the issue of their attitude towards tithes and offerings. So it's quite interesting. And then in verse 
8 to 10, he continues. He says, bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Why the connection between returning to God and being obedient with the full tithe being brought into the storehouse? Surely it's not a matter of buying our way into the relationship with God again, right? Why does God bring up the matter of money when you're speaking about relationship with him? Are you reminded of Jesus' words? Your heart and your money are connected. And where your money goes, there your heart follows. More than anything else, what we do with our money reveals our priorities, our values, our allegiance, who we really trust in. As a friend of mine once said, I can't remember who, show me your bank account and I'll show you what you really believe. And that might sound harsh, but it actually is challenging because it's got truth in it. So God says, bring the full tenth into the storehouse. And this is going to sort out a heart problem. And it's going to bring faithfulness back into the land. He says, bring the full tenth. Bring. It's very key. Not give. Bring. This gives us an idea as to who this really is. We're not giving our money to God. We're bringing what he's entrusted us to bring back to him which is rightfully his. The full tenth. Remember I said the, the, the CSB uses the word tenth and I think the NIV uses the word tithe along with some other versions. But remember I said the biblical description of the word tithe is the first tenth of your increase. If you do a study of first in the Bible, you will see that there's a rich teaching on first First fruits, firstborn. Christ is described as the first fruits of his church. We are described as the first fruits of the new creation. What does that first fruit indicate? Ownership. Christ is the Lord's. Who are we? We are the Lord's. We are the first fruits. Because the first fruits in the Old Testament were devoted to the Lord. The first time your um, crop produced a harvest, that first harvest, you take that harvest and you bring it. Three times a year. Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And you bring it to the temple. And you don't know whether there's going to be a hail storm the next day and wipes out your trees for what you're supposed to live on. But you bring it in faith saying, Lord, all of it is to be under your authority. And I trust you. God always requires that the firstborn be his. Firstborn of every child. Firstborn of every animal. You have to redeem it back if you wanted to keep it. God has an issue with being first. I wonder why. Well, I think in Genesis 1 verse 1, he makes it clear. In the beginning, God. So God is first and he is worthy of all our first. These deal with matters of the heart. Because when God is not first in our heart, and how do we display whether God is first in our heart? We demonstrate it with our hands. And what's in our hands? Our ability, our wealth, our time, our talents, our treasures. See, God doesn't want lip service, friends. He wants real worship. Because real worship changes lives and real worship brings blessing. Real worship puts him on the throne of our lives. And when God is on the throne of our lives, we experience freedom. So it's for God's glory and it's for your benefit. All of God's teachings are always for the good of his people. Of our increase... The first tenth of all our increase, if you, if you go read Leviticus 27, on all your crops, on all your grain, on all the bread you break, on all the animals of your flock, you know, for those that uh, dip their cattle or do that thing, every tenth cow, hey, take that one, that's the Lord's, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's the Lord's, one, two, three, four, that's the Lord's. That was what Israel was required to do. And so in our day, 
of all our increase. You know the whole debate, do I tithe on my, on my net or my gross, you know, after tax, before tax? Some pastors say, I don't know, it's unclear, but I tithe on my gross. Adrian Quinlivan, who preached here two weeks ago, says this, how would you like your salary increase to be calculated? On your gross or your net? On all your increase, the interest you earn on your investments, the inheritance you receive from your family, the big business deal that you do that comes in as a lump sum. Lord, the first fruits, the best, a tenth goes into your storehouse. We don't tip in the church, we tithe. And um, I say that with great humility, knowing that some of you are maybe on a journey in this. This is not to condemn anyone. But uh, unfortunately, there's been a habit in, in, uh, in some of us that's developed that we think we're honoring God by just bringing out the change that's in our wallet on a Sunday. And that's what we give to the church. The full tithe. Tithing in the Old Testament was said as it was brought to the temple. As I said, there were three feasts in the earth in the year: the Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And um, when they brought the tithe, they would say a prayer. It's written for us in Deuteronomy 26, verses 5. You bring your basket of your full tenth, your first fruits. And you would say, my father was a wandering Aramean. He went down to Egypt with a few people and resided there as an alien. There he became a great, powerful, and populous nation. But the Egyptians mistreated and oppressed us and forced us to do hard labor. So we called out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our cry, saw our misery, hardship, and oppression. Then the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, with terrifying power and with signs and wonders. He led us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. I have now brought the first of the land's produce that you, Lord, have given me. And they would say that, and they would worship. And so tithing in the Old Testament was given as a way of remembering God's deliverance or salvation, of acknowledging God's provision and blessing, and of giving thanks for God for his faithfulness. God says, bring the full tithe into my storehouse. What was the purpose of the tithe in the Old Testament? It was to make corporate worship possible. It was to keep the temple maintained and all its happenings to make sure that the priests had everything they need to facilitate the corporate worship of Israel. It was to provide for the priests. Remember, the, the, the tribe of Levi had no inheritance in the land, but the tenth of all of Israel was collected on their behalf, and that's what fed themselves and their families. And the tithe also enabled the community to provide for the fatherless, the widow, and the foreigner. In other words, ger generosity flowed out of the Lord's temple, temple because the storehouses were supplied. In Ephesians 2 verse 19, we read that the household of God is his church. You know, friends, that God speaks of his church as his household, and he has designed it that the food in his house is to be supplied by the people who are part of the household. Do you know what's the worst kind of famine that can be had in any country? is a famine of God's word. And so if we want a famine of God's word in the land, then stop bringing the tithe and let the storehouse be empty so that there can be no ministry. Paul warns us of spiritual decline if contribution to ministry is neglected. Galatians 6 verse 6, he says, Let the one who has taught the word share all his good things with the teacher. 
Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to the flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life from the spirit. This verse is given to us in the context of supporting the ministry. In other words, sow sparingly to God's household, reap sparingly from the spirit. Sow generously to the flesh, expect much misery and disappointment in the long run. So generously to the Spirit, expect the blessings of eternal life to be experienced. Friends, we want a spiritual feast in Middleburg and in South Africa, not a spiritual famine. So let's make sure the storehouse of God is full with our first tenth of our increase. What's our fear? that Malachi addresses. Lord, if I give the full tithe, will there be enough left over for me? Will I be able to make it in this tough, financially hard time if I give the tithe? Because Lord, you don't understand my financial position, my bond repayment and my car repayment and my children's school fees and the insurances I've got to pay. And the money I've got to pay to support my family. If I do all the sums, Lord, there's not enough left over to pay the tithe. The Lord knows. I've got good news for you this morning. The Lord cares about your finances. The Lord cares about your financial well-being. And so he gives us two promises. He intros it. He says, test me in this way, says the Lord of armies. And see. I want to pause there for a moment. In James chapter 2, verse 23, James is talking about justification not in the same way that Paul is talking about justification in Romans chapter 4. Justification can be used interchangeably. I know this is confusing, but stay with me. This is where a lot of confusion is crept in in the Bible. Paul is talking about righteousness by faith. James is concerned about works flowing from faith. Paul uses the example of Genesis 15 to verses 6, where Paul just believes God's promise that he would be delivered a son, even though they were old, and it says it was credited to him as righteousness. When James talks about being justified, he's talking about reward and inheritance. I know it's confusing, but bear with me. How do we know this? James in in James chapter 2 uses the example of Paul in Genesis 22. Abraham is already saved. He is believing God that even if he sacrifices Isaac, God will still provide for his promise. Abraham is being obedient post-salvation to inherit the promises of God that have got nothing to do with his redemption, have got to do with what the more that God is drawing him into. And James says, because of his obedience by faith, post-salvation, Abraham is a friend of God. Malachi says, if you want to see God in action, trust him with your tenth. Those who see God in action will know God's ways. In the Bible, everyone who knew God's ways is described as a friend of God. In other words, if you want to be a, put yourself in a place where you get to know the living God, trust Him with your money. Trust Him with your wealth. And then God assures us, see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. What does this mean? Well, we get to experience the authority of God over our resources and live in the superabundant resources in which in heaven there is no end. And secondly, why is it that if we withhold the tithe, we never seem to have enough? It's because of the devourer. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not ruin the produce of your land and your vine and your field and will not fail to produce fruit. See, mammon is a real spiritual power, and when we worship it, 
It devours what we have. It causes us to flitter away our resources. And where we thought we would have been better off with keeping the 100% for ourselves, those who gave the 10% and kept the 90% end up better off. And I've seen this with my own eyes. Sounds like a good investment, right? Sounds like financial freedom, right? When we bring the whole tithe, the 90% is not eaten by the enemy. If we give God our 10%, you invite God's authority over your 90%. You see, financial freedom is not measured by financial independence. Rich people and poor people can be financially enslaved. Financial freedom is measured by who resides over your wealth. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So if you want financial freedom, then you must have the spirit of the Lord come in and take right, rightful ownership of your wealth. James, how on earth does this tie in with Genesis 14? Let's go back there. Abraham described as the father of our faith. Yo, we're going to end it at half past. There has been a 50 minute sermon if we get to half past. Are you guys good? Okay. I felt a bit sticky here, but, but I think we're getting through it, eh? Okay. It's wonderful. Let's bring the gospel in. Abraham has come through a journey. He's been rebuked in Egypt, comes back to the land. And then he's seen God give him a great victory and deliver on his promise to give him the land of Canaan. And now Abraham stands at this climactic point where the land is his and the kings and their plunder are in his hands. Powerful position. And it says a guy called Melchizedek comes out to meet Abraham. A king and a priest who represents Jesus to us. His name, Melchizedek, means king of righteousness. And he's also the king of Salem, which means king of peace. Therein is the gospel. You can only have peace with God if you're declared righteous. Abraham, father of our faith, Melchizedek. What's happening in Genesis 14? Jesus and us. Jesus and us. A picture of Jesus and us. This is 400 years before the law, friends. Tithing is, is not a law code that Christ has abolished. It's something that happened even before Moses was given instruction about the tithe. Abraham defeats the kings with his men. The king, Melchizedek, brings out bread and wine. What did we do this morning in communion? It's a picture of the redemption of God through Christ on the cross. And then what does Melchizedek do? As a priest, he blesses Abraham. This is significant because in Genesis 12, God says, I will bless you. Genesis 14, Melchizedek says, Abraham is blessed by God most high. And when Abraham realizes that actually God enabled the victory and that God owns everything that he has, it says God gave him a tenth of everything. Hebrews 7, well, let's start from Hebrews 6 verses 20 to 7 verse 8 says, Jesus has entered there, speaking of the Holy of Holies, on our behalf as a forerunner, because he has become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God Most High, met Abraham and blessed him as he returned from defeating the kings, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, righteousness, then peace meaning king of peace, without father, mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, 
whether Melchizedek was an incarnation of Jesus or whether he was just a picture of Jesus, we don't know. The author of Hebrews says, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Now consider how great this man was. Even Abraham, the patriarch, gave him a tenth of plunder to him. He's going somewhere with this. If you understand the tithe, then you understand the tithe is for the Lord. Because it's God's. And if before any law was given and out of a spontaneous worship of the heart, Abraham saw it fit to give Melchizedek tenth of everything, then it's got something to do with the fact that Melchizedek must be superior. And if it's just a picture that was pointing to Jesus, then the ultimate reality is Christ. And out of response of our salvation, we bring a tenth of all we have. And we say, God has given us a great victory. And everything I am is his. The sons of Levi who received the priestly office have a command according to the law to collect a tenth from the people. That is from their brothers and sisters, though they also have descended from Abraham. But one without this lineage collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. Without a doubt, the inferior Abraham is blessed by the superior Melchizedek. In the one case... Speaking of Levi and even the picture of Melchizedek, these were people who died. In the one case, verse 8, men who will die received a tenth. But in the other case, speaking of Jesus, because the context of this whole Hebrews chapter is Jesus is the great high priest in the order of Melchizedek. He lives forever. And I know the language is a bit confusing, but friends, Jesus is the great high priest who is eternal and he still collects the tithe from his people. Not in order to give them salvation, but because he blesses his people and they do it out of a response that he is the king of kings and the great high priest. Colossians 1 verse 18 says, he, Christ, is the head of the body the church, the household of God. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. I'll tell you my last thought. I don't think the tithe, this is not biblical by the way, but this is what I think. Just want to make that clear. I don't think the tithe will ever end. Because we'll always be dependent on God. And we'll always live under the blessing of God. And God will always own everything. And he will always be rightfully. Um, worthy. Of our first. I end with this. I said this is a message about financial freedom, inviting God's Holy Spirit over our finances to bring us true financial freedom from serving the power of money. In a time of financial stress, I believe that's fitting. And secondly, I said this message is about faith. Let me read you a quote from Daryl Johnson. Lack of funds is not the obstacle to accomplishing the mission of Christ in our time. The lack of funds, it has never been the obstacle. God has provided the body of Christ with all the money that is needed, just as God has provided the body of Christ with all the spiritual gifts that are needed. Lack of funds is not the problem, it's lack of faith. Lack of confidence in the one who can turn water into wine, who can take five loaves and two fish and feed 5,000 people and have 12 basketfuls of leftovers. Why don't we stand together? Why don't we make a faith decision today to put your full tenth into God's storehouse that there might be food in his house and a spiritual feasting. 
Let's see the full house, the storehouse of God, full of food and spiritual revival in our hearts and in our nation. This is what we believe as solid ground. Amen. We're going to run five minutes over time. I, um, I debated whether we should take up an offering. I, I wanted it to be clear that this was not about trying to draw more money out of the congregation. We're serious about that as a leadership. We're serious and not about using the word of God to manipulate for financial gain. But we do believe that the storehouse of God should be richly supplied for the mission of Christ. And we do, do believe that Christ, the firstborn, is worthy of all that we have. And we do believe that the tithe is biblical. And we do believe that the tithe is of all our increased. And it's the best part. It's the first part. And so I actually feel to land it in an offering. And if you don't have money to give, that's fine. But we're just going to... We're going to worship. And I just pray for a faith response in your heart. As we hand the basket round, we're going to sing and then we're going to end with a prayer. And we're going to go home. And we're going to celebrate that God has made us financially free. Amen.